Greetings, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another edition of the Monsters Dan here on this glorious Sunday morning. And joining me in the co captain's chair today, Mr. Dan Brown. Good morning, sir. How are you today? Good morning, Peter. How are you? And all the fellow monster viewers in Monsterland. Uh, I am good. I hope everybody else is. Uh, today, we've got a very special show as we're starting to get into some kind of like ranking episodes on monster films and monster film series. Uh, today, we're going to kind of rank the universal horror films. We're going to each pick out our 10 favorite universal horror films. All right. So, of course, these started off in the early 30s. Uh, they kind of bleed, bled into the 50s, but the, the kind of glory years were the 30s and the first half of the 40s. A lot of varying degrees of quality, but of course, this is the film series that really launched the careers of three horror icons, right? So Boris Karloff, Bela Lugosi, Lon Chaney Jr., mm -hmm. as well as other folks that we'll, I'm sure, talk about during this uh, this segment here. But um, so we've got 10 films that are, our, that are considered our favorites. Uh, we might do a couple honorable mentions at the end. <clears throat> Mine are, I, I've tried really hard to put mine in the order of, of preference. This, see, you gotta understand, I think Dan and I both will agree here that these films have been with us a long time. Uh, I was watching these films since I was like three, four, five years old. So, and I'm in my mid fifties. So I have a lot of history with these movies. In many cases, I've seen these films dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of times. And there, this is probably my favorite, like kind of horror, film series if you want to call it that of all time and i love the hammer films and godzilla films and you know the slasher films i love all that stuff but there's something about the universal horror monsters um and you know those three actors that are like part of my dna i guess so uh so i'm gonna i'm gonna kick us off with my number 10 here like i said i think i'm gonna go kind of in my order of my favorites dan mentioned to me before we went on that he's his may not be in any order but it's his 10 favorites and he'll explain kind of why as well so i'm going to go with and let me just find it here so uh i am going to be drawing quite a bit today from this blu-ray box set which is the universal classic monsters all right this basically has all of the monster films all 30 was it 30 31 right 30 film collection right so i'm going to go with my number 10 as the first uh the, the creature from the black lagoon from 1954. So they made uh, three creature films, Revenge of the Creature and The Creature Walks Among Us. Uh, I, I enjoy all three. The second one is probably the strongest of the, of the two sequels. Um, but the first is a really good film and I rewatched it recently. And I think it holds up really, really well. Great cast. And it's funny how, you know, as you kind of watch, like I, I was watching, or the, yesterday I was watching a lot of the Universal giant insect films. So, you know, Tarantula and uh, the giant mantis. And it's funny how like a lot of the, the character, the actors that, you'd, that you saw in this film and some of the other films from the 50s kind of show up in all these movies. But I guess that's no different in the 30s and 40s, right? You had Dwight Fry and, uh, and uh, you know, all these other actors who would kind of show up in all these films. But back to the creature. Um, I love the cinematography of the film. I think the creature costume is one of the best. Um, it's got the beautiful Miss Adams, right? Who is just uh, stunningly beautiful in this movie. Great underwater scenes, uh, really good acting. You get to see the creature quite a bit in the film, which is really good. Great ending. Of course, you know, you think the end is, that's the end of it. But of course they, as Universal did quite a bit back in the day, it's like just because a character or one of the monsters dies at the end of the film, doesn't mean anything. We'll find a way to bring him back in the next one anyway. But uh, yeah, the, the Creature from the Black Lagoon, the original from 54 is coming at number 10 for me. Okay, well, let me get a little intro on how I viewed everything. I, I initially put everything in chronological order from the 30s. I didn't go into the Creature of the Black Lagoon, uh, although I, first off for the record, I love all universal horror films, good, bad, or indifferent. So when Peter says pick 10, it's like, great, that's how do you pull this off? As a matter of fact, right, I right, yeah. that. <laughs> One of my selections, actually, I decided to break the rules and double dip. And since two of these films are so close or literally in the continuity department are connected fully, I've got a film and its sequel as one film because they're so connected. And I it did it because I couldn't take one or more off the list. I wanted to add something. I didn't want to take one of these off. And there's a lot of personal reasons why I have some of these universal things, not with me, but with my wife's family. 
uh, the creature, I was never, you know, it was great. I, I enjoyed the creature as a kid. I've never, um, and I know a lot of friends are into that creature in a black balloon. That is it. And um, I have a lot of friends that are into it. Uh, I never, I love the first film. I watched it maybe because I'm more partial to the 30s and 40s. And by the 50s, uh, you had the big bug monster movies and stuff. And it was more so, sci-fi oriented. Yeah, yeah more sci-fi. And I never really was a big sci-fi other than Flash Gordon or Buck Rogers or a few other serials and things. So, but I always enjoyed the creature. And it was so funny because some years ago, I had a fellow I was buying things from, memorabilia things. And I honestly, for a person who's Creature of the Black Lagoon is not his most favorite film, okay? I have a creature bust, I have models, I have this and that. People, oh, you must love the creature of Black Lagoon. I tell people, can't stand him. I just happen to have all this stuff, you know? But I, you know, I, I don't want to get rid of it because I'm just stupid, you know? And, um, but anyhow, and I'll tell you an interesting bit about Creature is that uh, there was a rare film that circulated around. You said there was a trilogy. And I'm going to add trivia into all this stuff because I do a lot of research into these films. And they filmed the third film at, I think, SeaWorld in Florida. It was, a, it was a water park. Well, at one point, there's a rare film that is out there that a copy has circulated that the crew from the third creature film with partial, partial creature makeup did a 20 minute, 25 minute short silent film as a spoof. At, and uh, I'll get you a copy of it. It's not great quality, <laughs> but it's just this one bit because the creature's got half of his makeup on. So he looks like something out of a, like some movie from the 60s, The Beach Girl and the Monsters or The Beach Girls and the Monsters. It's really bad, but it's done by the actual crew. Wow. From them. And they use 16 millimeter. And uh, I'm not sure if what's her name is in it, uh, the, the female lead in the third film. But anyhow, it's a fun little piece. But anyhow, my thing I, I did, um, what I will do is I will look at it real quick and I will go 10 to 1 and explain why things are my favorites. Um, the first one I'd like to put out would be only because um, it would be Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. Now, as a universal horror film, this was like the first of their big monster rally films in which they decided to combine more than one creature into a film or monster. Um, the film starts out and to this day, the first seven minutes, six to seven minutes, I believe, maybe a little bit less, uh, when the, the grave robbers go into Larry Talbot's crypt in order to steal jewelry and they open his crypt. I mean, you've got the atmosphere. It is probably one of the most compelling openings of any film. So, <clears throat> yeah. so compelling, so frightening, even by today's standards, that when they did a castle abridgment in the 60s, they would do these 200 foot reels. Uh, Castle Films was owned by Universal, was bought by Universal in the 1950s. And they had the rights on Castle Films, these silent eight millimeter films, eventually sound for home use, that they had the rights Abbott and Costello, W.C. Fields, uh, and most importantly, the Monsters. And they made 200 foot abridgments that only last 10 minutes. They're silent, they have little subtitle cards underneath, and the earlier ones they edited to make a cohesive, coherent story in 10 minutes. Well, so compelling is this Frankenstein meets the Wolfman uh, opening that actually the first five minutes of a 10 minute film is that sequence. They don't even touch it. And not since Frankenstein, when it came out in the graveyard and, you know, have, I've never seen any more compelling. And it holds up to this day, the lighting, the shadow. After that, the film slowly starts to decline to the point in the end, uh, Frankenstein and the Wolfman, they fight for less than 90 seconds with clever editing. Uh, the storyline is kind of silly, but once again, a, a film that uh, for that first seven or eight minutes, I can watch the beginning of that over and over and over. Uh, it's just so well done that I consider that one of my favorites and also the fact the two got together and we know the history. Lugosi was supposed to be able to talk during the film, he didn't. When he did his dialogue, people were laughing. Uh, he's supposed to be blind, which was actually explained in a scene that was cut. Most of Frankenstein, and yeah, I mean, that's yeah. where the continuity factor, right? Yeah. They yeah, and just the continuity of factor was universally near the end, they didn't pay much attention to what happened in the previous film to the next film. And I'll explain that later in another film. They lost continuity and you didn't mind it because by 1943 to 44, there's a few gems. They were gearing these monster films like 
Frankenstein meets the wolf, um, Wolfman, House of Dracula, House of Frankenstein. They were gearing them towards children. They were scary, but let's pack as many monsters as we can. And, and there's another factor while they were doing that as well. But Frankenstein meets the Wolfman, one of my top favorites, if anything, the first seven minutes and a couple of seconds in between. Um, and, I, and I cannot deny that. So there you go. Cool. More about that in a couple of minutes. Um, all right, so my number nine, almost kind of pains me to put this so low on my list, but um, I just I love this film. I think we can we can safely say that every one of these movies in our top 10, we really like a lot, all right? Uh, I just think, I've always thought this film could have been a little better. And I just happen to enjoy some of the other films that are gonna come after it a little bit more. But I'm gonna go with uh, Dracula as my number nine from 1931. Uh, I love Lugosi's performance. I think obviously he was the right guy for this film. Uh, again, you talk about kind of opening montages. I mean, that opening scene down in the crypt of the, of the house, of the castle, you know, when him and the, the vampirettes, whatever you like to call them, come out of their coffins. I mean, that's another one of the best scenes ever. And I think like Frankenstein meets the wolf man, the rest of the film is not quite as good as that sequence, I don't think. Maybe when Renfield comes to the castle and, you know, they walk up the stairs, you know, I bid you welcome, you know, and that whole thing. That's very well done. There's a lot. I, I think when, for me, this film suffers a little bit after they leave Transylvania. I think the whole sequence, the whole part of the film where they're at the castle is amazing. Uh, once they get on the ship. And I think, you know, um, Dwight Fry as Renfield is amazing in this film. I think the acting is great. Um, I just think this film is a little slow, okay? Uh, I think, unlike a lot of the other Universal films, there's no real music in this, which I think would have really given it more of an impact. But I think it's still a classic film. I, I love Lugosi. I mean, Lugosi, out of all these guys that we're talking about today, uh, especially, you know, Lugosi is my favorite. I absolutely love Bela Lugosi, and I love almost everything he's done. I think he has, even though most people cite this as his, you know, his best role, I actually, there's a couple others that I would actually put maybe a little bit higher. I think him as Igor is amazing. Uh, I actually think his role in White Zombie is amazing. Uh, the Human Monster, he's psych totally psychotic in that one, as well as his role in The Raven. So I think, he, you know, a lot of people think uh, Lugosi, they only think Dracula. He's got a handful of other roles that I think are on par, if not better than Dracula, but he was the right guy for this. And like I said, I do love this movie. Uh, I just think I like some other Universal horror films a little bit better. Um, so that's my number nine. Well, that'll, that'll put me to number nine. I'll, I'll use uh, this next choice, basically because uh, you've already opened with Lugosi. And I'm gonna put it number nine. It's not necessarily number nine, but it's the Spanish version of Dracula from 1931. That was done on the same sets as Lugosi at night while the Gossier film during the day, um, they filmed the other version at night. Um, I like it because the camera, it, it, where, as you said, with the original Dracula, the opening sequence is great, even with the displaced armadillo in Transylvania, wherever that came from. Um, I believe that um, the camera work is much more fluid in the Spanish Dracula. It doesn't hurt also that it is made during the pre-code era, and the women are scantily clad, you know, even the brides of Dracula, which they had lost that footage and they found it on a 16 millimeter print of when they come onto, onto Renfield, because that's why there's a big degradation in film quality, but it's creepy as hell. And the brides look much more creepy and animalistic, which is something that very few Draculas have ever captured because even Carlos Vallejos as, as Dracula comes up a bit more sinister and animalistic than Lugosi. I think Lugosi's, the thing is, the interesting thing about it is that, you know, Todd Browning, who was uh, Lon Chaney's go-to guy and put him on the map, he eventually did, you know, Dracula and then went off and did, of course, Mark of the Vampire. Uh, it's surprising that Browning, who was a really, really interesting storyteller, that he did Dracula so staticky. Now, the staticky was being very little movement. I think there's two reasons for this. And one is that Dracula, Lugosi could not speak English. He never mastered English. He learned Dracula on the stage phonetically, and he was not one to ever deviate and improvise. He went right by the script. So I think they did that just in simplicity's sake to keep the production flowing. 
and have put him in familiar territory. What happened to Lugosi's career after that is always up for debate. But um, the Spanish Dracula, it also runs, I believe, about 15 minutes longer. And I have to really sit and look at it again to get a grip on it and see where the major, 15 minutes is a lot of film footage, where the additives are. But I like it because it moves, it flows well. Um, my only down point about that is when they first introduce him, which first they have a dolly shot coming up the staircase, when, Lego, when Dracula's standing at the top of the staircase. The only problem is that Carlos Vallejos looks like he's constipated when the camera comes in on him. He has this demented look on his face, like show your face of terror. So obviously he would look terrorized and he's constipated because he had this look on his face. The acting is great across the board, uh, but I went with that one as opposed to Lugosi, but Lugosi's Dracula sets the precedent as does Frankenstein for many things. And, um, but I went with Spanish Dracula, if anything from the technical aspect and showing how something can be made in two completely opposite ways, in different ways uh, at the same time for certain audiences. So there you go. Spanish Dracula, 1931, which mind you did not, was not rediscovered until the 1990s. It was considered a lost film. And uh, like, as I said, the, the sequence where the brides uh, chew, up, uh, chew on Renfield, he passes out on the porch, not inside, showing the staginess of the first Dracula um, is far creepier and far more sinister. So there you go, Spanish Dracula, 1931. I advise you all to check it out. Yeah, that's a great choice with the, uh, the, the Spanish Dracula. It's definitely, definitely a different type of film, I think. Well, the tone's a little different. And I think uh, the actor who portrays the Count, is he's a little more over the top, right? Yeah, I agree. Whereas Lucy's performance a little more kind of subdued, reserved. Yeah, it's definitely different. I, I like it. I enjoy watching that every couple of years. That's, that's it's fun. That's definitely fun. All right. What do we got? So number eight for me. Let's dip into my box set here. I originally did not have this in my top 10. Then I realized that I excluded and I was like, whoa, wait a second. There is no way my top 10 cannot have The Invisible Man from 1933. I mean, this is a fantastic film. And again, maybe more of sci-fi than actual horror, but it's definitely creepy, definitely unnerving in spots. And I think uh, for me, even though he's under the masks for the entire film, uh, Claude Rains' performance in here is, is absolutely magnificent. And uh, there's just some sequences here. I mean, we really think about what they did with special effects in this film. It was way ahead of its time. You know, you look back on it now, you know, you watch it now and it's like, you know, and, and for those of you who have like, um, or maybe, you know, have never seen The Invisible Man in ultra high definition on Blu-ray on a 4K TV, you know, you watch this and the one problem with having like 4K TVs is when you see these old films that use, you know, cruder forms of special effects, not CGI, obviously, you can kind of see the little fishing lines and you can kind of see the, the, you know, the outlines of the green screen, all that kind of stuff. It really shows up. So, you know, you can tell that uh, the techniques that they used were pretty crude and rudimentary back then. But for the time, for 1933, I mean, this was revolutionary stuff. You know, a guy sitting there with bandages on, takes the bandages off, the rest of the body still moves. And I mean, pretty, pretty cool stuff for the time. But I think, um, you know, the whole long sequence at the uh, the inn, right, where uh, the Invisible Man's character is staying upstairs and the uh, the, the lady, the, okay, the wife of the, uh, the, the owner of the bar, who of course also is in um, Bride of Frankenstein, right? So the... Uh, the crazy, I call her the, the crazy lady, right? The Una, Una, Una O'Connor. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, she's she's amazing in this film. Uh, but it's this is just a uh, a really good kind of depiction of how the feeling of absolute power can totally damage your brain, and we know all about that in today's world, right? So I think that this film was way ahead of its time in a lot of re in a lot of ways. And uh, a really, really thrilling, thrilling watch that I think only gets better with age. And, you know, this could even rank a little bit higher on this list. But again, you know, a lot of these I have such history with. But I think The Invisible Man, especially the first one. So, you know, there's been some, there's a bunch of sequels. So if you get this particular uh, 
deluxe edition here with the box set. You've got uh, The Invisible Man Returns, The Invisible Woman, Invisible Aging, The Invisible Man's Revenge, and Amina Costello Meet the Invisible Man. So quite a, quite a lot of in, Invisible Men uh, films, but the first one is by far the best. And it's, it's a great achievement um, in the kind of canon of universal horror films. And uh, definitely one, if you haven't seen it, I mean, I did a whole Monsters Den episode on this film itself last year sometime uh it's well worth checking out it's it's a great 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 movie. and it still holds up well today even the, even the primitive special effects it does hold up yeah i mean with the 4k yes you pick up with blemishes i think in the film called horror island that universal did for the longest time the only way to see horror island was either on television in a syndicated print or people had transferred 16 millimeter prints when they did a just a dvd not even a not even a blu-ray restoration there are certain nuances in the film, like the set. I think it was actually a scene I have not seen it yet, but a friend of mine says you could see one of the hand uh, from one of the crap the backstage people in the background, <laughs> but did not show up. You know when it came out in theaters, and if it did, you'd never be able to see it anyhow because that's the only time you could see it was when it on its initial run. Yeah. But 4K and Blu-ray scrubbing can bring out uh, certain primitive nuances that you would not see regularly. It doesn't take away from the film, actually it makes it more fun. You know, we like to see the bats on the string. It's okay, we get that. You know, if we had Ed Wood could do with hubcaps as flying saucers, anybody can do it. Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> we were um, watching, uh, I was watching The Sentinel the other day. Uh, I just picked up the Blu-ray not long ago. And you know, when you're watching it on 4K, there's a scene late in the film where- Is that the film uh, with Chris Sarandon and- uh, Chris Sarandon's and face is like, kind of like the flesh is kind of falling off his face. And on the 4K, right. you can literally see the string pulling, pulling it a chunk of, of makeup. I mean, we're watching, we're like, holy cow, that's so noticeable. Well, back in the day, you would never see that, right? On non-HD uh, screens. And but I'm surprised they didn't go in and take it out unless they want to go into the problem because they've done, they, they can go in and take out such a yeah. new one, something it's like that. Yeah. Though. It's amazing. It's just like all of a sudden you see, you see that, that the fishing wire go boop, and just pulling that thing right off his cheek. I'm like, what the hell? Maybe they should have put fish hooks on it. It could have been Hellraiser. So there you go. It's uh, <laughs> they were taking care of that, right? You know, um, you know. Since you're on the roll with Invisible Man, which is not on my list, but since we're on the Invisible Man, which is also directed by James Whale, yep. and there's certain things about the Invisible Man that uh, has James Whale's very dark sense of humor. He always had a dark, macabre sense of humor, or tongue in cheek, and that appears in Bride of Frankenstein. This, oh, yeah. and it appears quite obviously in 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 the Old Dark House, which is the next one I want to talk about. And the old dark house is really, in many respects, is a horror comedy, more horror, but it's got some of James Whale's nuances in there. Uh, I liked it because once again, this is a film that up until about 1970s was gone. Didn't know where it was. And I had gotten exposed to it like many people uh, growing up in the fifties and such with like stills from, cause it wasn't in the syndication packs. There's no one, you know, you couldn't find it. And, um, You'd see it in famous monsters of film land and maybe stills would pop up and it was nothing but myth and legend. Well, it did appear in the seventies and a person had a print and it was eventually released, not on universal, any of those universal films. I believe it may have gone into public domain at, at some point. Uh, they did do a restored version on Blu-ray about two years ago, which is worth the investment. I have it, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And you know, once again, we've got, you know, we've got James Whale's sensibilities, the old dark house thriller, creepy, whatever. Uh, Charles Lawton's first role, I think, in the, in the United States. I'm gonna grab it, grab it. What's that? You're gonna grab it? I'm there gonna you grab go. It. Here we go. What is it? That's the uh, is that the what is the, the name of the yeah, oh, the Cohen, the Cohen film Cohen group. Film collection, yeah. Yeah. They do a lot of restorations. They uh they have actually a lot of interesting stuff out there that pops up. Uh, occasionally some of their stuff pops up if you have the Criterion channel on streaming their stuff will pop up but anyhow getting back to it it's got you know it's got melvin douglas it's got um gloria stewart yep. who was in titanic yep That's who played right. the old uh, old old woman in titanic it's yep. got charles Law. it's got raymond massey it's basically a british film because you know james whale has charles law in there's first u.s role raymond massey was canadian um ernest thessinger as roderick femme you know, and strangely enough, the fellow, the person that plays the uncle, I believe it's the uncle or their father bedridden up in the attic is a woman in reality. <laughs> then, but the film is fun. It moves right along. And of course it's got 
Karloff, Karloff. as Morgan, yeah, Boris, the Karloff, yeah. and, and being referred to as Karloff at this time. Uh, great little film, a little bit of tongue in cheek humor, well crafted, well thing, and it's got those James Whaleisms that, in my estimation, made him an underappreciated director in the scheme of things. Um, lately, I've been looking at a lot of James Whale's obscure films that are not part of the monster canon. And um, he, um, yeah, interestingly enough, you know, he's got some great work out there, but grew tired of it, you know, and probably got tired of the system and moved on. But The Old Dark House, no doubt. Uh, a real treasured find that said circulated back in the 70s again and now available on Blu-ray. Well worth the investment if you're into any kind of universal horror. Yeah, I think um, probably one one of the films, if not the film, that kind of set the stage for all those strangers stumble upon a house full of nut jobs type of thing. The crazy family, right? It's like that, you know, because of course they all come in from the storm, right? It's like so, like there there have been so many other films, you know, backwoods horror and all that kind of stuff, where you have normal people who just happen to fall into the trap or fall into a house or the lair of this family that's just like absolutely out of their mind, so to speak, right? Well, to switch, you know, to switch gears just for a moment, it's so funny if you're talking about old dark house films. And true, a lot of the slasher films taking a piece of this. Now, there's a whole genre of films uh, back in the 1930s that referred to as forgotten horrors. And these were put into a book in the 1970s initially by a fellow named George Turner and another author. And these are the obscure, like majestic pictures, small independent film companies that many of them actually use universal back lot sites, sets to film. The vampire bat is done on the Frankenstein sets. Um, White Zombie was done on the sets from Hunchback of Notre Dame, uh, Dracula, you name it. They use all these back lot sets. But the forgotten horror thing is that people will see these and they are creakers. They creak along, they're slow. But Today's audiences and people that I had a discussion with a fellow who was a writer in Hollywood. And he, he said to me one day, he goes, all oh, these films like this. I mean, God, they're using that technique of I don't know, the, the hand coming out from behind an example. Not exactly, but coming behind the bookcase. I said, don't you realize that thing you say that is corny and in cliched? I said, that's where it was invented. That was the first time they did it. Now, speaking of James Whale, quick, not to switch gears. They wanted, I think it was James Whale, they wanted him, since he was such the king of horror, they wanted him to do Daughter of Dracula. And he just refused. He didn't want to do any more. He didn't want to do horror. He wasn't crazy about it. You know, and he ended up doing a film called Remember Last Night. He brought them a script from a best-selling mystery novel so he can get out of doing Daughter of Dracula. But he did make references to the Daughter of Dracula in the Remember Last Night script as a, as a jab at Universal Studios. Uh, as a matter of fact, somebody's going to jump in the pool and I think you look at, look at me, I'm the daughter of Dracula. And he was just doing nothing but just doing a big, give you the middle finger to Universal. I'm not doing your crap anymore. So it was kind of funny, a little bit of trivia there. But yeah, anyway, I'm sorry, go ahead. Your turn. My turn. All right. So uh, I'm going to there. I, in, see, the thing is, in this Blu-ray set, you have sometimes you have some of the films uh, that are included twice because they're both uh, a Frankenstein film and a Wolfman film or a vampire film. So I'm going to go with um, Frankenstein meets the Wolfman is my number seven. Uh, they're available on both of these uh, sets here. And that's, of course, from 1943. Yeah, I mean, I'll, uh, I'll agree with basically just about everything that Dan said. I mean, you have that wonderful, creepy, atmospheric opening sequence which is, yes, one of the best kind of seven minutes or five minutes in almost any of these films. I mean, it's that well done. I mean, there's, I mean, you know, they look through the window, there's the full moon, they, they're clearing off the wolf's bane from Talbot's body, which is perfectly preserved, right? And then they're trying to take off the ring, all of a sudden his hand moves and grabs him, right? I mean, there's, it's just, it's amazingly done. Um, I, you know what, this movie has a lot of faults. But I still really love it a lot. I, you That's know, this, how I feel I about up, it. This was one of, you know, I always mm -hmm. love this movie because, because again, it took two of my favorite monsters and put them together. And even though the ending battle is not nearly long enough, uh, it's well done for what it is. But I love uh, Cheney's performance in this. 
you know, it's a real shame. And, and you know, you got to wonder when they were editing this film that they didn't realize because based on you know the, the the original cut of this film legend legend tells it was much different uh they actually intended to make this a direct sequel to ghost of frankenstein if everybody remembers the end of ghost of frankenstein uh they do the brain switcheroo and igor's brain goes into the monster's body and then the monster then talks with Igor's voice, which would be impossible, but that's what but he's blind. Doing. though. He goes but he's blind. blind also. The surgery made him blind. So if you watch this film, so now you've got Lugosi playing the role of the monster. He plays it like a blind person. If you notice the way he walks, his eyes are almost closed the entire time. He's always like reaching out very stiffly, like, you know, doesn't know what he's walking into. Um, so it makes perfect sense. But because they didn't carry over that continuity that he's supposed to be blind, that it's Igor in the body of the monster, right? That and apparently he had spoken lines in the original cut of the film. They took all those out. So you now see his mouth you, move. Yeah. So now you have this film where all of the scenes with Lugosi as the monster are almost like hilarious because they don't make any sense. Why is he walking so stiffly? Why does he have his eyes closed all the time? You know, it, it's like because they basically they ruin that whole aspect of the film. And, and it's unfortunate that Lugosi's performance as the monster is looked at by many fans as probably the worst actor to ever portray the Frankenstein monster. When, you know, the fact is, we really don't know what could have been. So I, you know, it's like one of those things, if you can go back in time, just take that time machine back and to be able to look at the original uh, footage of this film and to see exactly how he did all those scenes, what I think would have been really amazing. But, uh, you know, that notwithstanding is another weird thing. Talk about continuity. We can go on and on about the continuity problems in some of these films. So in this film, you have Talbot and the monster actually form a pretty close bond, right? Uh, they have to work together, right? And, and the, the monster trusts Talbot, but then at the end, of course, when Talbot turns into the werewolf, uh, they fight, obviously. But then when you go to the successive films, like the, you know, Horror of, Horror of Dracula, Horror of Frankenstein, uh, I mean, House, sorry, House of, House of Dracula, House of Frankenstein, it's almost as if, like, Talbot wants no part of the monster at all. And, like, all that's forgotten, which is a little bizarre. Um, but I still think... There's great performances in this film. Um, and you really feel for Talbot's character here, I think. Uh, you know, I think the one good thing about uh, Lon Chaney Jr. is he always had that um, sense of vulnerability and how he was trapped in this horror of a life. And you felt that from the very first where Wolfman film and every successive one. So you always really feel for him and hope that he gets what he wants. And, you know, and here he just wants to die, right? And that's kind of the theme of every successive film that he appears in as this character. Um, but I, I just, I love the performances here. I, as flawed as this film is, there's just something about it. Um, I don't know. It's like it's like one of those. I think everybody has in their list of favorite films that they've had since they were a kid. There's that one film that is so flawed you shouldn't like it as much as you do. This is that film for me. Yeah. It's yeah as you get older, you appreciate it. You yeah. Know, it's just I I, I can. Oh, watch you it see over. the flaws, but you still like it. You still like it anyway. You know, you sit there and you talk to the screen. You're like, oh, why did they do that? Why did he say that? Why? But that doesn't make any sense. But yet you'll still turn around and watch it a month a month later again and again and again. So that's that film for me. Frankenstein meets the Wolfman, my number seven. I love it. Yeah, I'd add I'd add something else that Frank, Frankenstein meets the Wolfman is that it's so funny the scene where he reaches out. Well, first off, what I understand and doing reading on it, um, the Wolfbane he actually was not dead. He was dead, but the Wolfbane kept him in a suspended animation. That's why he quote, didn't decompose. Yeah. Um, and it's funny, the sequence where the hand reaches out and grabs one of the grave robbers, okay? When you think about it, do you think Dan Curtis was influenced by that when Willie Loomis opened up the casket in Dark Shadows and um, Barnabas, Barnabas Collins' hands reached out and grabbed him by the throat? Just makes you wonder. Obviously people are inspired by something. Flawed oh, film. Oh. I don't know if it was addressed or not, but there was a, this film was addressed, but I know at some point, uh, about fifth, within the last 15 years, there's been a, a publications have come out where people have gone in and some particular writer and they found original scripts that were written in the Universal Archives for like the original scripts for this film or that film and even 
team ups and things that didn't never happened. And I'm wondering, I can't, I'm not sure if, if um, Frankenstein meets the Wolfman was one of these scripts. I'll send you the link. Um, the books are out there. They're put out by a small boutique label. You know, they were about $30 a piece, but it's actually these scripts as they were like final revisions or before final revisions. And you'll see many different things. There's a sequence in uh, Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. You see it in stills a lot where the monster is sitting in the cave with Lon Chaney Jr. And this was the scene that got all the laughs that got it cut out. This is a scene where actually Lugosi's character as the monster is explaining to Talbot their background stories, why he is the way he is. And it receives so many guffaws and laughs by test audiences. They said, we got to change this. <laughs> it's not going to work because he sounds like nothing more than some of them were referring to. He sounded like a Nazi or a, a angry Hungarian guy. And it's, we can't do this. So that's why they cut it out. And they want to, but like I said, as flawed as it is, I was in agreement with you on that. And you know, another thing too, another aspect also, it's like, you know, uh, Frankenstein meets the Wolfman made universal a lot of money. Oh, hell yeah. Why is it they did those sequels that they bring all the monsters together and they never had any of them fight? No, I know. I think it was more along getting more, it was more, it was quantity, not quality. Yeah. Because if you think about, they could have taken even things they did with the money, you know, when we say continuity, I mean, we can go back to the Frankenstein films, the first three, and see where continuity just makes no sense and goes out the window. Yeah. Uh, and they didn't really think that. I mean, I'm wondering if it was just an insult to the audiences. They didn't really do the research. Or that at that time, they were, you know, they were, understand there was no cable. There was no this. There was no that. I mean, the only way people went to the movie, it was the wartime. People were just going to the movies to escape. Even if you're watching a horror movie, although the real horror show was in Europe or in the, in, in the South Pacific. Yeah, yeah. Um, they didn't really think. They just pumped product out. As we said, the Frankenstein meets the Wolfman is referred to the first of which you want to call the monster rallies, in which they combined two actors or two monsters together. Um, there were thoughts of doing a Frankenstein, a uh, Wolfman meets Dracula. Which who knows may have been interesting. Now, an interesting side note to that too. Back in 2009, independent film company uh, had done a film, you've heard of it, it's called The House of the Wolfman. Low budget, uh, black and white, some interesting stories about it, uh, in which Ron Chaney, the grandson of Lon Chaney Jr. and great grandson, plays the doctor. He should be handling the estate. He's not a great actor. But you can see he was having a great old time playing the mad doctor. Well, they do happen to, you know, they, I think they purposely went out and they, they do have a fight between the Frankenstein monster and the Wolfman in this film. And this film, this fight lasts about five to seven minutes long. I mean, just brutal. So I wonder if that was a homage to that. And that film also it definitely was. Yeah, I've seen that. That's, that's actually a lot of fun. It's a fun it's little shot film. in black and white, which is cool. Yep. Great. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's actually the last performances from some people. The fellow who plays Dracula for a brief moment, uh, his name escapes me. He was known as being a makeup artist. Uh, he was known for looking just like Lugosi and would appear at concerts and conventions and even in film, a lot of films as an actor, but not necessarily as Lugosi. He passed away shortly after it. And the fellow who plays the manservant was a actor and he was directing, he was working on a documentary about horror conventions and he was struck and killed by a car at a convention in the Midwest. Wow. Yeah. And those are the last two rules now. But the film, nonetheless, you know, aside from the jarring real deaths, uh, it's interesting. It's entering homage and addition in a strange sort of way to universal monster rallies. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. So, anyhow, I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't mean, I didn't. The next pick. I just want to say I love uh, Jack Pierce's uh, Wolfman makeup in, in Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. Quite a bit. So really, nice. okay. He looks Anyhow, a little different in every film. He looks a little different, right? So they, they kind of tweak the makeup in, in, in every one of them. But I really like Frank Stein's The Wolfman. I think he looks the best in that film. But. Well, he got it tweaked by that point. By the time Avin Costello and Frankenstein came along, they had the Westmores doing the applications as opposed to building up layers. Right, right. He looked um, really good in that one too. I must say that's that's a little it's a little more. Well, we'll get to that. So all yeah, right. we'll get Your to next that. pick so, number six. Okay. <laughs> next pick number six. Uh, I am going to go. Um, well, this is going to be my double dip. Okay. And why I said this is a double dip, and I'm going to put them together because this is one of those rare instances where the continuity actually adds up. It makes sense. And that would be The Mummy's Hand from 1940, which was a sequel to The Mummy in 1932. Uh, and then followed, attached to it, 
It's like I refer to a music, I refer to American Beauty and Working Man's Dead as the greatest double album set the Dreadful Dead never put out. So I'm gonna sit there and say with The Mummy's Hand slash The Mummy's Tomb from 1942, which are direct sequels. And um, I like those for a couple of reasons. This is gonna be all the trivia aspect that I was gonna, the special treats I was gonna show you. Um, the Mummy's Hand is just a fun adventure story. It kind of, you can see where Brandon Frazier's film probably took a bit from this. There's a little bit of comedy in it, a little bit of light levity, but there's also the sinister characters. You know, George Zuko playing the high priest, uh, Tom Tyler, a Western actor, yeah. playing the, the mummy, mummy, which actually does a pretty damn good job. It didn't have to do much because it walk around, but nonetheless. Um, but the interesting aspects of the film, particularly with the mummy's hand, is in the beginning, uh, well, actually, George Zuko's character, he has like some some swarthy little sidekick who is a is a is a you know, Egyptian or something that kind of follows them out. He's like kind of the spy for George Zuko. And he's an actor by the name of um, Sig Arno. Now, Sig Arno was a big star in Germany that came over in the mass exodus from Germany. And um, he also was known if you ever watched the Palm Beach story. He plays the gigolo to one of the characters who speaks in a language no one even understands. Uh, but he was a well-talented music and dance guy. And he was in a number of films in Hollywood. Well, he happened to be a family friend of my wife's family, was good friends with her grandmother. So what I'm gonna show you is this is a painting of my wife um, done in around 1960 by Uncle Siggy, who was Sig Arno. Wow, so he wow. painted that portrait of her when she was a kid. But anyhow, I enjoy that film. It's fun, this. And then we bring it to the mummy tomb, the next one. Uh, actual direct community problems, not a thing. They somehow, why they bring Carrie's to America, maybe for revenge. And he always manages to meet some woman. He's obviously very lonely. He always meets a woman. That's the reincarnation of his girlfriend. And um, another aspect with the family connection, um, is the cemetery taker, caretaker, that comes to America wearing a fez, like he just came from a Sons of the Desert convention. And he's the one that takes the mantle from George Zuko, who's an actor by the name of Torhan Bey. And Torhan Bey uh, came to Hollywood. Well, Torhan Bey was my father-in-law's second cousin. And uh, I was very fortunate to have met Torhan a number of times for a Christmas luncheon and a few things when he would come to the US now and then. Very interesting character. Uh, he would share some interesting stories about Hollywood. Literally was the closest to getting married to Lana Turner until his mother said, you're not marrying that tramp and uh, things like that. But it was interesting. I'll tell you a little funny story. He, he knew Lon Chaney Jr. very well. And they were both contract players at Universal. And he sat and told me because he had done a film with Catherine Hepburn at MGM called Dragon Seed. Now, uh, they played Chinese peasants. Well, Torhan was Turkish and Mongolian. He looked Asian. He would be considered you call your Asian. So he played a Chinese person and he ran into when he was when he was doing when he ran in to Lon Chaney back like in 43 after, after the, the tomb of Dracula and then I mean so the uh, yeah the tomb of the mummy's tomb and then in turn went off and did two more films as the mummy he saw Torah and he goes Torah how you been what have you been up to and the conversation went where he says well I'm over at MGM and they've got me wearing this makeup on my eyes to make me look Chinese. And it's a bit upset, you know, it's upsetting my eye like this. And he always goes, what are you complaining about? He goes, how would you like to wear plaster of Paris for eight hours a day, wrapped around you or gauze? So anyhow, that's a little jokey story you told me about him. But nonetheless, uh, The Mummy's Tomb picks up. You got Wallace Ford, all the characters there, they get killed off, it's revenge. Once again, they storm the castle. I think they're a great one-two punch. And that's why I put them together. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I like both of them a lot. I think The Mummy's Tomb is fantastic. It's a lot of fun. And I think out of all the the films that Cheney played, The Mummy, I think that's my favorite. And Turhan Bey is, is amazing in that film. I, yeah, I mean, I mean, let's be truthful. Most of these Mummy films after the original are all kind of formulaic, right? They all kind of follow mm -hmm. a similar path. But I never had it, you know, there's some people like, oh, The Mummy is a terrible monster character because all he does is shamble around. And But... I don't know. I always, I always dug the mummy character. I always, I always love mummies. I think, uh, you know. I mean, the last two go off the rails. Like his yeah, body do. shows up in the bayou. Like where'd this happen? 
I know, yeah. uh, you know, it, the discount, they didn't care. But all we know is one thing is continual. He's always searching for a date and he needs a cup of tea. So yeah. that's that's the bottom line. And let's, let's be frank. I mean, you know, the mummy as a monster character, especially in these latter films, is not much different than the way they portray the Frankenstein monster in the latter stages. You know, like, let's face it, Glenn Strange looked great, but what did he add to the character? Really nothing. He just kind of, he, you know, half the half of every film he appeared in, he's laying on a on a lab table and he doesn't wake up to the end of the film. He grabs a doctor and goes into quicksand or goes into fire. I think right. the House of Dracula, he's in it for like 20 seconds. Yeah. Or actually mobile. Yeah. You know, he'll sit there and twitch or whatever. They book like, what's the Grizzly. point? The mummies he actually do a hell of a lot more. At least you know, the mummies are rambling about and destroying yeah. things, right? You got atrophy and you could pick up Boris Karloff and drag him into a swamp? Yeah. God, you are a beast. <laughs> Anyhow, go ahead. Your choice. All right. My choice next. I'm going to go with uh, number six from 1939, Son of Frankenstein, uh, which I'm trying to see if there's a shot of it here on the back. Uh, it's actually, no, I don't think I have any pictures of it. Anyway, it's in this set right here. So, of course, that stars uh, Basil Rathbone as uh, the Baron Frankenstein, right? The son. And uh, this is the first film where we see Bela Lugosi as the Igor character. Uh, we've also got, um, oh, his name is escaping me right now. He plays the uh, the Burgomaster, the, um, not the Burgomaster. You're about the policeman or the Burgomaster? Uh, the policeman. No, uh, that's um, oh, Lionel Atwell. Atwell, Mr. Atwell, yeah, who also appears in a lot of these films. America's favorite mad doctor. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And he's, he's a great mad doctor. Oh, yeah. Big time. But uh, Son of Frankenstein is great. I mean, I think this, uh, if you're looking at the first appear the three appearances with Karloff as the monster, this is probably the least successful of the three. Uh, he, I don't know. When I watch this film, I get I get the feeling he doesn't he's not as into it. Um, I, or maybe it's just the script. But I think this movie is so good because of Lugosi. I think Lugosi absolutely steals this picture. Um, and he's just got so many memorable lines in this and he's actually so like twisted and psychotic. It's just amazing. And what's, what, what's really incredible when you think about it, so this is 1939. So this is eight years after Dracula. So Lugosi was really falling on hard times from the mid 30s. His like real time at the top was very, very short. Uh, there's a great, um, great biography of Bell Lugosi uh, that everybody has to read if you haven't checked it out, which is just absolutely fantastic and talks about this time period, you know, where he was doing all those Poverty Row films and, you know, he had some successes, right, because he did do Return of the Vampire and he did do um, White Zombie and a bunch of other really good films, but there were none were like the big success that uh, Dracula was. So here with Son of Frankenstein, you know, you all of a sudden Lugosi's the man again, although it never really came to came to play, unfortunately. They extended his part in that film. It was supposed yeah. to be a very small role. Yeah. And the director, I think Reginald, um, what was his name, the director? Roland Lee. Took a shine to him, knew him, liked him, and made sure his rule was beefed up. But it was supposed to be a very small, small role. The good thing, the good thing it, uh, it changed for that, because I think without his character, without his role, being so important, I don't think we would look back on this film as, as, as fondly as we do. Because I think it's 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 not a fantastic performance by Karloff. I think, like I said, he is he's a little more wooden in this film. You know, he's got the big vest, you know, the big uh, wool vest on, and he's uh, you know, there's there's some great scenes in the film. Obviously, I love the whole closing sequence. I think Rathbone is actually very good uh, playing uh, the Frankenstein, Doctor Frankenstein character in this. Um, the sets are great. That house is awesome, right? I mean, those big ceilings and all that. I mean, the, the, the little sulfur pit down in the basement is fantastic. There's some great scenes. I love this. I love the scene where, uh, you know, because of course this whole film was about like Igor using the monster to get back at all these people who crossed him, who, you know, because of course Igor was hung. Uh, for his crimes, wind up, you know, he didn't die, you know, still Bangs his neck. <laughs> Bones stuck the throat, right? I mean, it's just some great lines in this film. Igor is good. <laughs> There's a scene when one of these guys who he's out to get is like riding in his carriage somewhere. And then all of a sudden you see like the Frankenstein monster just kind of like swing out from the side and grab him and choke him. <laughs> and run him over with the can, the, the, the wagon. I know. It's kind of like, he kind of swings like, God, I know he was so, you know, he was so versatile, you know? I know, right? Uh, it's just, I mean, so there's some great, there's some great scenes in this film and it's a lot of fun. Uh, but once again, you know, 
we think he dies at the end and then bloop, not to be the case, right? So, um, but still, I, I mean, it's it's a top-notch universal horror film, I think. It's just when it, when you talk about the first three Frankenstein films, it's, it's my least favorite of the three, but that doesn't mean I don't love it. So uh, that's my number six. That's, that, it's also on my, my list. Uh, and the thing is, the reason why I like it is a number of reasons you said. First, it's very fast paced. It doesn't play around. It done. It picks up that cliffhanger serial, you know, with the with the, of course the the music and this. And this was actually, in all honesty, this was Universal's return to horror films because there was a horror ban going on after 1936, after the Invisible Ray, I believe. There was a lot of outcry, particularly in England, about horror films and how it warped children. Well, certain films like The Black Cat, The Raven, they are pretty much over the top you know, and at that time, and they put a ban on it. And finally in 1938, there was a small movie theater. So there was no horror films made in 1937, done. And this is where Lugosi really started to slide, found himself in poverty row. Matter of fact, P.S. Uh, Bela Lugosi was originally intended to play Dra uh, Frankenstein, did not like the makeup. Apparently test footage was made. There was actually a poster with him on it, like him as Lugosi. And he didn't like the makeup, so that went to the side. You know, he was like the George Raft of horror. He turned down a lot of roles and, or didn't want to do roles because it, it would diminish his acting ability or his, or his looks. Uh, but now this was the return, 1938, a small movie theater noticed that they could rent Dracula and Frankenstein, the original films, uh, for a nominal fee, you know, usual rental fee. And being an independent, although there was a ban on horror films from the major studios, you can do second run features in small little town theaters. And it was a small theater in Los, Los Angeles that rented those two. And he had a round the clock line, lines around the block, around the clock in front of his theater. And finally, someone at Universal said, that's it. We're going to go back and make horror movies. That's where the money is. This guy's making a mint. So that's where Son of Frankenstein came from. Uh, I like it when it's fast paced. Basil Rathbone just coming off of Sherlock Holmes at, uh, which is probably another reason why Universal signed him on aside from getting rid of certain B films in the Fox, Fox studios. Um, but also you know, the, the, the sets are like very much have German expressionism. They're very large and dark. Now this is where the continuity problem starts getting really weird because number one, there's the laboratory that supposedly left over when they blew it up in the first film. It's pretty good shape too, but it's only a stone's throw, a walk up the hill, like you're going up to a gazebo <laughs> from the mansion. <laughs> which the house that Frankenstein's family lived in, even the original films, was in downtown proper yeah, in yeah. the village. Uh, and Anna, this is where the continuity starts getting really bizarre. You know, um, but once again, a bit of trivia note, um, probably the first time a hunchback assistant was called Igor. Yeah. You know, it was Fritz and any number of names. But once again, I like it. It's fast paced. It is the weakest of the three, but it has a certain, you know, one never forgets an arm torn out by the roots <laughs> or when he's putting the darts in his arm. I mean, these are just great nuances. I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to wonder if like that was Lionel Atwell, you know, cause he was a stage actor. That was his improv, improv, improvising. And of course they did a great job with it in young Frankenstein spoofing it yeah, right. in the whole aspect. But no, I'm very much on tune with that one of you. Um, it's on my list. So boom, off and running next. Cool. All right. So, uh, we're number five. My number five is uh, The Raven from 1985, 1985, 1935. <laughs> With Lance Hendrickson. I don't know. It's... So yeah. this is, um, you know, Lugosi and Karloff appeared in a lot of films together. I think for me, you know, we just talked about one of them, which obviously is very notable, but of course, it's, you know, there's no lines for, for Karloff in that, obviously. But I think for, for my money, The Raven is the best film for their pairing, I think. Uh, and ironically enough, because another one, which I'm sure we'll talk about, which is the Black Cat. So they, they kind of flip-flop roles in these, where one plays the bad guy, one plays the good guy. Although in The Raven, it's they're both kind of not good guys, right? And it's just, it's a lesser of two evils. So here you have um, Lugosi playing this you know, kind of, he's kind of like a scientist, a doctor, right? Who is sort of at the end of his career, and um, and this whole this whole story is is influenced by uh, Edgar Allan Poe. Obviously, he's a big Poe fanatic in this film. And you've got um, Karloff is this like escaped convict, right? His name is Bateman, and he stumble upon you know this the doctor, Doctor Wallen, right? Wow, Doctor yeah, Wallen, Wallen was right? it? And uh, 
Dr. Wallen is like, he is, again, he's, his, his medical career is kind of at an end. He falls in love with this young lady who's young enough to be his daughter, who he obviously can have. And that starts to kind of, you know, make his uh, marbles scramble just a little bit, right? And so what he does is uh, Bateman comes to him. It's like, I'm on the run. Uh, I need you to do something to my face so I don't look like me so I can go out and, you know, because he's escaped. And so Dr. Wallen comes up with this idea that he's going to completely disfigure him in this operation so that he can get this criminal to do his bidding for him. And by do his bidding, it's to go out and seek revenge on some of these people who have wronged him and specifically to help him get uh, this, this young lady that he's so uh, in love with, right? So, so that he does that. And then the whole film kind of, um, and there's just some great scenes. I love the scene with, um, after the operation where after he disfigures Bateman and Bateman's in this like kind of like resting room in the laboratory and Lugosi's character is up top in one of the windows looking down into the room and he's like oh go ahead Bateman take off your take off your bandages whatever and then all of a sudden there's mirrors all over the place in this room so he takes it off and he's of course horribly disfigured and he actually you know it's one of his eyes is drooping down here that you can actually kind of see uh, right there and you know, Bateman started, looks at himself and he's absolutely horrified and Lugosi's up there maniacally laughing at him, right? In typical like mad doctor fashion. And then like <laughs> um, Karloff's character, Bateman takes out his gun, which of course has no bullets in. And he looks up at, at Lugosi laughing at him and he gives the like total Frankenstein. And it's like, it's like directly ripped off from, from the second Frankenstein film and takes the gun and smashes into one of the mirrors. Right. So at that point in time, you know, Lugosi's character is basically like, you know, I will, I will put you, make you look back to normal, but you have to do some stuff for me. Right. Okay. It's so, kind of backwards. Yeah. And again, so we're, we're all just going back to actually this predates. All right. Cause this is uh, four years before, but they kind of use that same thing in son of Frankenstein where Lugosi's character gets Karloff's character to do his evil bidding, to get revenge on people who, and, he, and yeah. who gets in son of Frankenstein. Also that someone gets Frankenstein's monster looks into the mirror in son of front. Was it, was it Basil Rathbone or, or Bill Lugosi? I can't recall. Uh, Basil Rathbone held it up. Made him look in the mirror. Okay. You know, it's, it's, it's funny. The Ray, I, I stand corrected before. Actually, it wasn't The Invisible Ray. The Invisible Ray was the last film they did. The film that got the horror band going was The Raven. The Raven, yeah. Because of its, you know, gruesome possible, the pit and the pendulum, the, the, the face makeup, the whole thing, uh, which adds to something. And you know, aside from Universal, which are very great films, they're the, you know, they are the benchmark for horror in the 30s and 40s in particular. There were so many other films that made by other companies that are if not better and more creepy. Yeah. Um, and I'll just cite this at the same time, The Walking Dead. I don't want to get into it, but with Karloff as the gangster brought back to life. But anyhow, since you mentioned The Raven, I'm going to throw on, you may have to mention this too, and you have to segue, you may have to add into it. We're going to go to The Black Cat, 1934. I have not seen The Raven in a very long time, but The Black Cat sits uh, in my craw, so to speak, on a very creepy level for just so many reasons. I mean, revenge, Satanism, um, yeah, has nothing to do whatsoever with the Edgar Allan Poe story. Uh, the only thing is that I believe that Herr Polzig, which is, um, no, Lugosi's character, I can't remember, Das Hammer or something like that, his name was, he is, has a fear of black cats and it makes him freeze with fear. And that's it. There's no explanation for it. You know, all we know is that, you know, and Herr Polzig, which they were apparently, I don't think they were on the same side, they're on opposite sides in the military. And Karlov has built this huge, very art deco, a compound of glass and, and just it's an art deco temple that he lives in uh, wearing like this very weird haircut uh, he looks kind of like uh, Linnea Quigley in uh, the return of the living dead you know with that little spiky hair and uh, but he's you know he, he's basically a satanist yeah. and he has his wife now I don't know what is what here. I can't recall. I know that he has his wife in suspended animation, like in a tomb downstairs, in a glass tomb. And I believe it was Bella Lugosi's wife 
before the problem. Um, there also is the woman who uh, Herr Polzig or Karloff is living with at the time is Lugosi's daughter. Now there were rumors at one point that Ulmer wanted it to be his own daughter, like bringing incest into it because the um, black cat was made right at the cusp of the film code. And people were trying to get as much stuff in as possible uh, before. So they kind of dropped that idea. No, nah, he shouldn't be sleeping with his own daughter. That's like too weird. And it became Lugosi. I don't know how true that urban myth is, but the film is very creepy uh, to the point where they have a chess match. You know, they're sitting there parrying back and forth. You know that they hate each other. And then meanwhile, you got David Manners, I believe, uh, who was in Dracula, who was in um, a number of universal horror films, a British actor. I can't remember the woman who played the girlfriend, his wife. They somehow are on the train and because of a storm, they they have to stay in the evening. In the So they get brought into this house of revenge and madness and just tension. And I think on the other side of the coin was the building was built on top of an old munitions dump. Well, it was a munitions dump, but it was also a place where a great battle occurred. And there were thousands of bodies buried under the building. Like it was this battle in the First World War of massive you know, atrocity and carnage. Uh, so it has this, all these weird, it was Edgar Ulmer, uh, who was a gifted, talented actor, who's another guy just never seemed to grab grab hold of anything. And I think the black cat ended up becoming to him what, uh, because it was so out there, so over the top, so gruesome and, you know, psychosexual craziness there. I think that that ended up getting him put into a hot seat, like Todd Browning, when he did freaks and he studios are going like, he's just way out there. <laughs> so he did make a little poverty row thriller called Bluebeard in the forties with John Carradine, which is very good. But he always rose above. He always rose above his material. So the black cat, just on so many levels, once again, required a viewing for anybody in Karloff and Lugosi, as well to the Raven. That's a one-two punch. Yeah, I will black say, cat. arguably, the black cat and the mm -hmm. Raven are probably the two most disturbing and scary films in all uh, out of all these movies we're talking about. And ironically, neither mm -hmm. one of them has a traditional monster, so to speak. But I think, you know, when you look no, at the, the fear the, of humans. Yeah, exactly. They're just demented people, right? And I think that what I love about both of those films, and I always, I always kind of, they're like a package deal for me, both of yeah. them. Mm -hmm. And what's great is that you have, you know, Lugosi playing two completely different characters in both, and Karloff playing two completely different characters in both, and they both work. And I think, you know, when you look at all the films that they did together, because, you know, a lot of the later films that they did together, Lugosi would play these, like, secondhand characters that just, like, you know, had nothing to do with the main storyline, but they would use his name, right, to attract people. Oh, we have the both of them here, but really, Lugosi has nothing to do. Whereas both of these films, Lugosi has a lot to do. They're on equal footing. Yeah, oh yeah. Big I, think, I think at one point in time, Karloff as his, well, as somebody sat there and said, the funny thing is why Karloff, is not maybe, oh, maybe background, grasp the English language. Lugosi was not a big socializer in Hollywood. I mean, Karloff stayed pretty much to his British friends. Like the Lugosi stayed just with Hungarian friends because there were always little enclaves in Hollywood. And I think what happened is one of the curses that they had about Lugosi was that Karloff was under makeup. Um, he played, you know, Frankenstein, he played Fu Manchu. He played all these places with makeup and then he would play like a bad guy as himself. But Lugosi was so, the, cur the Dracula was a curse. He became so assimilated with Dracula that it was always his face. So Karloff was able to like expand upon his roles, whereas Lugosi could not. He was always Bella Lugosi. And I think that was one of the downfalls as well. By the time they did The Invisible Ray, following these two films, Universal was actually, it was kind of like, well, you know, Lugosi's the supporting actor in this one. They weren't even on equal footing at this point. By 36, things were starting to slip. Yeah. Um, there were people who knew he was talented, but that's another film. You know, that's another film for another day. Sci-fi film, not great, but... Hey, once again, Universal Canaan, it's all good with me. Yeah. Definitely. And uh, I just want to mention, too, which they talk quite a bit about in that book, The Count, that I was talking about, that Lugosi biography, is that, you know, he did all these films uh, in that decade and throughout the 40s. And for whatever reason, Lugosi was never the guy to negotiate his salary. So they'd be like, oh, you know, we'll give you $2,000 for this film. He'd be like, okay, whatever. 
And he was when they when you go back and look at the salaries of a lot of these big. Oh, he made no. He made nothing, and he never like questioned anything. He just took whatever they would no, give. He him. Took, that's why he worked all around. He didn't like people were people were he didn't have a very good negotiator or manager, something along the line. Maybe he managed himself. We don't know the inner workings. We don't know. He may have been a, he may have been a hard ass to work with. He may have been very difficult. I don't know. Some people, you know, some people put people in such. We're all humans. We have our moments, you know. Um, but he, you know, you never know. It could have been something to do with himself. When he was doing Dracula, he was not considered for Dracula, although he established the role on Broadway. Yep. Okay, he was, a, you know, they were going to give it to Ian Keith, a British actor, who was not that well known. Now, they probably were looking at it with the fact that Ian Keith was a fairly successful actor in England. And many times they made films in those days. Okay, they in fact would have that European audience. World War II put a big clamp on all of this because they had no more you know, European audiences to buy, watch films. Um, but Lugosi was not considered, he was not even considered to play Dracula in Abbott Costume Frankenstein. Yeah, I know. You know, uh, he, you know, he was basically off the radar, uh, off the radar by you know, 1945. I mean, he came into a couple of the RKO films, you know, but he played in secondary roles. Um, you know, and that's what ruined him, you know, and he, but he was constantly looking, didn't negotiate. He was always looking for work, you know, and he was only paid $500 a week. Now, don't get me wrong, $500 a week was good money, you know, in those days, but he was paid $500 a week uh, to play Dracula as the lead character. And ironically, in the early 1960s, okay, that's all he made off of Dracula. And he was never considered, to, he was supposed to be in Dracula's daughter. And something happened and they used, they used a, wax effigy of him to burn in the beginning of the film but he was supposedly being written into the script at one point something must have happened but in the early 1960s when the aurora models started using lugosi's image uh, on models and marketing for universal studios and things like this his son bell lugosi jr who was a lawyer at this point was the was the lawyer that started the image usage law he sued universal studios and so you're using my father's image as Dracula to market things when in fact you have no permission to use that. Yeah. And he only made, what was it, $3,000, which big money in the 1930s. And so, you know, he was kind of disrespected all along the way. And it wasn't until finally when Martin Landau played him in Ed Wood, you know, and Landau won an Oscar in some strange Twilight Zone, third door, third squeegee my third eyeball world. <laughs> Finally, Lugosi was acknowledged as an actor. Finally, right? All those years yeah. there, too little, too oh, So late. anyhow, we get off on tangents, but they're informative tangents. Yeah, yeah. So next, uh, am I up or up? I just gave the black cat. So, All right, so um, I'll go with number four for me. Uh, I'm going to go Bride of Frankenstein. Okay. So from uh, 1935, obviously the sequel. Uh, there we have uh, Frankie and his bride right there, right? Mm -hmm. Miss Elsa. Um, you know, a really, a really good film. And I think uh, I know a lot of people who actually prefer this film to the to the original Frankenstein. And I, I really I couldn't argue that much. Um, I think the production techniques of this film are amazing. Uh, the sets are amazing. Uh, you know, there's a raw grittiness to the first film that this doesn't have. This obviously injects a lot of uh, humor into the film. Which, you know, I think may, you know, do you really want to do two exact films exactly the same? I think of, uh, you know, Shade and Light and Shade are kind of when I look at the first two Frankenstein films. And, um, you know, Colin Clive once again reprises his role, right, as, uh, as Victor Frankenstein, the tortured, uh, the tortured doctor, right? And uh, I just think um, this is a spectacular role for Karloff because not only does he get to inject more humanity into the character, the creature. I mean, he talks a little bit, you know, there's some classic scenes here, you know, where he's with the, the old man and, you know, the blind man and all that. I mean, there's just, there's a lot of really, really great scenes in here. Uh, you get to know some of the townspeople as well. Like I said, I think the cinematography of this film is great. I love the scene where uh, he's like running through the countryside and you see like all these like crucifixes and all these weird crypts all over the place. I mean, it's just, and granted, this is all shot on a universal lot, right? This is not out in the mountains of anywhere. Uh, but I just think it's a really fun film. It's a, it's a deeper film than the debut. The debut for me is a true horror film. This 
has its element of horror, but it's, it's a lot more to this movie. I mean, this in a weird way also brings in some sci-fi and fantasy, I think, into this, uh, into the, the whole Frankenstein mythos, I think, but uh, it's, it's a wonderful piece of filmmaking. And, uh, you know, when you look back on it, it's like 1935, it's like, wow, you know, they were having these thoughts and putting these things into films way back then. It's, it's a movie that's way ahead of its time. So that's my number four. Well, I'm also on board with you, Bride of Frankenstein. It probably is my favorite in the scheme of things. Uh, but since you mentioned, I'd add into it. Yeah, this is a film that originally, one of the original critics, when they went in for preview screenings, they said it's the best two hours of your life. Well, the film ended up being 75 minutes. Yeah. Then they had cut it down to 90 minutes. Um, some of the things that were cut out that I know for a fact uh, is there was a little bit more involvement with little miniatures on Dr. Pretorius's uh, thing. There was a scene where actually uh, Dwight Fry plays Carl and his brother. There are two characters, they play twins. And one of the brothers uses the Frankenstein rampaging through the countryside of killing people, okay? He murders an uncle to get his inheritance and they blame it on the monster. However, the monster, there, the original body count in the first cut was 21 deaths, okay? There was only 11 in the final cut. Uh, also, there's a possibility they mentioned that the schoolgirl they find murdered Okay, um, she was killed by one of the Fry brothers, if you want to call them that. Uh, but anyhow, it's a film that has that James James Whale sensibilities. Uh, once again, the continuity just goes off the charts. Um, number one, if you see his body fall off the fall fall off, Doctor Frankenstein falls off the windmill and jam, lands full impact on a windmill thing, goes to the ground. He's, He's probably not going to survive that. <laughs> no, but he was in pretty good shape. Now, also, his wife's hair went from because he had to get Valerie Hobson to play his wife because what's her name? Is it May Clark played the wife in the original film? She was not available. She was also she had also dealt with a lot of personal problems, so she was not available. So they bring Valerie Hobson, who was seventeen at the time, eighteen years old to play his wife but all of a sudden his wife goes from uh blondish or light hair to like brunette yeah what happened you know she got her like in all this in all this stress and i'll just dye my hair uh you know and did this and then of course the the castle has that kind of like midway maybe they were maybe they were renovated it went from the typical universal village house downtown to this kind of like all right it's getting a little gothic here with the big staircases and this and that and uh, then eventually goes to the son of frankenstein once again totally off the, off the charts with that but a well-done film i mean it hits all the things all the scenes that you hit i mean sitting with the uh, you know sitting with pretorius in the grave with that weird organ music playing while they're drinking wine uh, as a matter of fact the old hermit played by op heggy uh james whale pushed off uh, production for a while because he wanted O.P. Heggie to play the hermit. These were all people he knew. Bernard Stesinger was a friend of his from England who was stage actor. So he brought a lot of his old cronies into doing films. He did a great job of casting. And what Ernest Stesinger went on to do films way up into the 1960s. But he's known as playing Dr. Pretorius here to see you. You know, all that stuff. Uh, a number one, love it. I could watch it over and over and over. Um, you know, it still marvels me after all these problems, just like when Godzilla tramples through Tokyo, nobody's ever ready for this. Right. They've never prepared. There's always fleeing. Same as they don't realize, you know, oh, let's put him in a chair and wrap him with like, what, bungee, bungee, bungee cords, you know, and he breaks out and everybody's like panicking and running and freaking out and stuff, you know, uh, you know, so it's, it, they never learn, but it's well done. And, um, probably it is really one of my favorites that I could watch over and over for the pacing. And it's like, it's funny, you talk about um, continuity. So, you know, the monster is running all over creation in this film. So did he forget how to run in the successive films? Because Cheney didn't do any running. Uh, yeah. Strange certainly didn't do any running. Uh, neither did Lugosi do any running. So it's almost like he he uh, he got it all out of the system in this film, I think, right? Right, that was, maybe he was in leg braces, I don't know, <laughs> falling in the, you know, maybe, I don't know, yeah, whatever happened. Now, the funny thing about, ironically, when they blow up the thing, there's a lot of, there's a lot of faux pas in the film because originally uh, Dr. Frankenstein was supposed to die with his monster at the end of that film. And if you notice, if you look at it, especially you can see it now with your Blu-ray and it's been brought out years ago that as the building is falling in on them, after apparently Dr. Frankenstein and his love have escaped, 
there is Dr. Frankenstein in the laboratory against the wall. You can see him in the distance, but they decided to make it a somewhat happy, upbeat ending. So he survived. And there's a lot of things you can go on about that film, but once again, not, cons not inconsistencies, it's just the reason why actually it went to two hours at first is that, and Universal Studios itself was a studio that really, whereas MGM was always Louis B. Mayer and Paramount was Adolf Zucker and all these guys were pretty consistent over the years. Universal went through so many upheavals from the, with Carl Emley Sr., you know, leaving in 1935, leaving into the hands of his son, Carl Emley Jr., was like 21 years old. And then eventually the film was, the studio was sold in the mid 40s, becoming Universal International. But uh, the reason why James Whale had a field day, he tried to arrange the shooting around a time when Carl Lemley Jr., who was head of production, was on a vacation to Europe. So he just went hog wild. And that's why they originally had a two hour cut and then a 90 minute cut. And then finally at 75, they have searched and they have looked for all the original cuts. They have searched and looked for the Frankenstein meets the Wolfman cuts. Now, be surprised where things are found. Yeah. But to date, no snips, cuts, edits, original things shown up. Who knows? But anyhow, yes, I'm on board with that with Bride of Frankenstein. And I guess uh, the bride was not made of the same stock as the monster, right? Because she she's obliterated in that film, never to be seen again, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and she's only in the film for a short period of time. Yeah, like what, five minutes, if that? Less than that. She's in it for very little. And as a matter of fact, there was actually, they had to do some editing because apparently they were, you know, apparently like Lord Byron and Mary Shelley and, and um, who was the other one? Yeah, Lord Byron, Percy Shelley, and Mary Wilson Cross Shelley, you know, they were like the equivalent of like, uh, I don't know, uh, swingers in those days. They had like a wild, there was a film that came out called Gothic. They would take drugs, they had all kinds of crazy orgies and crazy stuff. And they kind of hinted at that in the beginning that we, we are all open free thinkers. Hayes Coates, no, 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 you can't go into that. Nope. Yeah, we can't go into that. Sorry, let's snip those 15 seconds out, you know, so anyhow, but that's, yeah, my, my, I'm on the same page with you, Bride of Frank, because once again, all these films we're mentioning, I believe, are necessary viewing. If anything, view these 10 or 15 films we're probably going to mention today. Yeah. Um, and you get a good understanding of it. Yep. As you do with this next one, uh, another one of my beloved uh, films in this in this whole series. Uh, number three is 1941's *The Wolfman*, the not the first appearance of a werewolf in a Universal horror film, right? But uh, oh. the first appearance of Lon Chaney Jr. as the Wolfman character. So uh, you know, *Werewolf of London* obviously was the first werewolf film that Universal made. Very good film, I might add. Uh, that just misses my top 10. I like that one quite a bit. But, you know, here's where it all really kind of happens. And again, I'm going to mention that that kind of vulnerability, you know, you really feel for this character, I think. And whether that's that was the intention from the beginning or whether that's just, that's Cheney, right? I think Cheney had this way, no matter what, who he was playing. I mean, you just really felt for him. Like a very underrated actor i think that kind of you know he got pigeonholed into this role that he did so well but i think he was just a really really good at what he did and uh you know once again you have cloud reigns in this film plays his father you have the introduction of uh, maria alson pueca is that how she says her name who's been gaia who's been gaia okay yeah the, the played um maleva the gypsy woman who's amazing uh and then you've got bell lugosi playing a small role in here as her son as a gypsy woman's son who is the original werewolf in this film who actually bites Lawrence Talbot's character but you don't really get to see him in any kind of werewolf makeup they show like a dog right um, which I think was a missed opportunity I think they could have done something there but uh, a great film a very gothic and atmospheric film I love the sets here uh, you've got um, you know the very kind of early and raw transformation scenes right you know very little of it shown in this film but you would see it in later films and again you know it, it's like you look back on these old films with the wolf man it's like you know so you know you've got Talbot's character getting ready to go to bed right and he's wearing like a pair of pants and a, uh, a white tank top and then he changes into the werewolf and then he's walking around out in the woods and he's got this really long sleeve black shirt buttoned up to the top and a pair of pants with the belt yeah. and it's like you know wakes up wakes up with socks on you know, it's, wakes it's, up with it's, socks on all of a sudden the tank top is back or what happened to that long sleeve shirt he was wearing it's like all right you know so the, I guess 
you know, they don't have a ton of budget for these films. So, you know, they opted not to go for the full body fur and all that. And I get that. But um, but still a, a really fun movie. And again, you know, at the end, you think he's dead, as we found out in Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman, not the case. But, you know, you really felt bad for his character. You really felt bad for his character. And uh, marvelous performances from everybody in this uh, in this entire movie. And it, it's always been one of my favorites. And I think when you when I look back on all the many great werewolf films that we've had over the last, you know, close to 100 years, uh, I will say this is probably a top three for me. You know, you got American Werewolf in London, you got The Howling, you got more recent ones like Dog Soldiers, Ginger Snaps. There's been a, quite a few more recent days, but the original for me is always one of the best. Of, of, which, of which the Benicio del Toro Wolfman actually very good. that storyline, very close to that. Very more close. so than some of these other reboots they've done of some of the Universal films. Um, you know, it's funny, it also has, for anybody that likes Eddie Murphy movies, uh, Trading Places in particular, uh, Ralph Bellamy, who plays yep. the local police gendarme or whoever it was, uh, he is one of the brothers, uh, Mortimer, I can't remember what his name was, but in the film Trading Places, him and Don Amici played the brothers. They were both actors in the 30s and 40s, particularly Ralph Bellamy going back to the early 30s. But he plays in this film, as does Warren William, uh, who plays the local physician. Uh, who was a, a really scoundrel CAD guy in all the early pre-code um, pre films. You know, he's always like sexually abusing people in the departments. Wherever there was a place to be sexually abused, he was doing it. Uh, and he also played Perry Mason. But he was actually a well-done and known actor in the 30s whose career ended in the late 1940s. But Ralph Bellamy's in that film. I like that film. I didn't put it on because I figured you would mention it. Uh, you know, and I think it's important we both have some different stuff now and then with each other. Um, so what I'm going to do is my next uh, my next choice is going to be, you know, there was a couple of films made in the mid near the end, you know, between 1942 and 43. I think 43 is when they hit their peak and things started to whoop, slip. And that film is going to be called Night Monster. Uh, Night Monster is a standalone film, does not fill into any canon of any motion picture, but it's about a, I think he's a multiple amputee who had a, um, who doctors worked on him. I believe that he was a doctor in his own right. And um, basically he invites, you know, when anybody invites all the people that are responsible for your deformity to a dinner party, you know, it's not going to end well or a weekend in the country. And what happens, and this guy is also the Ralph Morgan, uh, who was Frank Morgan, who played the Wizard of Oz's brother in real life. Ralph Morgan plays, I can't remember his name exactly, but he plays this fellow who is, uh, he's missing an arm. I think he's missing one of his legs. He's paralyzed, you know, pretty much not really a quadriplegic, but he's, he's pretty messed up. And he uh, invites them over and he also has a, an actor by the name of Niels Astor. He plays like this Indian Swami that is his consultant. And then all of a sudden, there's a lot of fog, and mystery, and intrigue, and you know, even actually the opening sequences of the um, of the, the mansion with the fog is actually stock footage from the Wolfman. They started, you know, Universal was known for repeating the same floods and exploding dams in every movie, whether it be serials or whatever. Um, but nonetheless, uh, he invites them, and all of a sudden, mysteriously, everybody is dying. You know, uh, getting murdered. And they can't figure out who is. There's a monster in the swamps. People will leave and all of a sudden they're on the road and all of a sudden like all the crickets stop and this eerie silence. And then all of a sudden people find themselves being murdered. Uh, you find out that in fact, he has been able with the help of his Swami uh, or mystic, he's been able to recreate his legs and arms or in his mind and also turns into real legs. And he's been systematically murdering off all of his compatriots. Universal stock players are in there. Uh, Lionel Atwell, once again, is in there. Um, and I think actually a young guy that plays a chauffeur in the house who's constantly harassing the, the new, uh, you know, the new housemaid comes in and he gets the tar, he, he gets zones in on her. And that's played by a fellow named Leif Erickson, uh, who was an actor in the early 40s, who was young, and then he eventually became like a major TV star in the 60s. I think he was on High Chaparral or one of those Western shows. But nonetheless, Night Monster, standalone, creepy, um, well done. And as a matter of fact, it has always been referred to by the critics in those days. 
is referred to as a great standalone horror film. I wish they had kept up that quality. You know, this and another film I'm going to mention remind me, uh, I view the world of Universal Studios as in, like the X-Files. And not exactly, but the X-Files had this underlying conspiracy theory that eventually took over the whole series. But the real gems in the canon of, let's say, the X-Files were these standalone monsters of the week. These one episode offshoots that were like, wow, that's creepy. And that's what Night Monster is. And as in whole canon, it's a standalone film that stands up on many levels on its own two legs without the aid of a swami. So there you go. <laughs> Next. I got. I have to rewatch it again. I haven't seen that in quite a long time, but it is very good. It's a good choice. All right, uh, we're up to number two. Wow. So I'm going to go with. Uh, for some, might be an odd choice having so high, but um, it's probably the movie that I have watched the most in my entire life. I love it for the greatness about it. I love it for its weaknesses and faults. Um, Abbott and Costello, Me Frankenstein. And there's, uh, there's Bud and Lou down at the bottom of there, right? There they are. Um, you know, this for me is what House of Dracula, House of Frankenstein should have been all about. There's all these monsters together. They all have a lot to do in the film. They kind of fight each other. They go, you know, they go chasing after the two main stars of the film. I mean, this is like a true kind of creature feature fest uh, that I think really works on all levels. Like I said, I've seen this movie. I just watched it again like a month and a half ago. I watch it religiously at least a couple times a year. And I know like almost every line in the film. Uh, <laughs> you and 20 million other guys. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, they brought back uh, Lugosi as, as Dracula and he looks really old because he was at the time, um, you know, for to play this role. And, you know, you mentioned earlier that he wasn't one of their first choices to play Dracula in this film. You, know, you have to wonder, would they have drug Carradine out again to play or I don't know no, they actually meant they actually mentioned Ian Keith oh, the guy did. that was supposed to play in 1931 so here's a guy that got screwed out of a role twice twice you yeah. know and he went off to do a film for Republic called Valley of the Zombies that's for another show at another time but yeah. go ahead but I think Lugosi does a great job here you know other than the fact that he looks a lot older uh I still he's got that it quality uh Talbot's character is great. Again, there's no continuity here. So of course, you know, uh, you know, besides for the Bud and Lou part of this, you know, uh, Ch Chick and Wilbur, you know, Wilbur, Ch Chick. Ch I mean, it's just, there's so many great scenes in this film. The whole scene at McDougal's House of Horrors when they go to deliver the exhibits in is one of the greatest scenes in any movie ever. Right, because you got the lights go out because of the storm, and you know Chick, who is is uh, is Abbott's character, he's outside trying to get the lights working. So Costello, who plays Wilbur, is inside trying to un you know get everything set up, and you know you got he puts the candle down on top of the casket, and you hear the and then the candle moves, and he's looking at it right, and it's it, the whole scene is just absolutely amazing. But then you know you have like all of a sudden again, once again, because. Uh, at the, the end of House of Frankenstein, Lawrence Talbot is apparently, his lycanthropy has been cured. He's no longer a werewolf at the end of that film. Now, all of a sudden, in the beginning of this film, he's calling from London, trying to track down the bodies of the Dracula and the Frankenstein monster, <laughs> and he's a werewolf again. Right, and he waits, wait. He could have called him at any time. He waits on the night there's a full moon. Right. It's like, you know, what the moon should be up in three minutes. I should make that long distance call through America, you know, and so and right in the middle of the call, Mr. Talbot, will you, will you get your dog away from the phone? Oh, I mean, it's, just, it's classic stuff. It's classic. But then, you know, he comes. So then, you know, they make it seem like Larry Talbot as the, you know, the Wolfman character has had this long standing war with Dracula and the Frankenstein monster, which never happened because in all of those other films, the, there's only one instance, and I believe, I'm trying to remember if it was in House of Dracula or House of Frankenstein, where Carradine and Talbot interact briefly in one scene because he's coming out, he's, they're like going to therapy, right? I think that's in the last film. Yeah, and they meet in the waiting room. They meet in the waiting room, right? That's the only time they ever met. So now all of a sudden in, in Abner Costello and me Frankenstein, there's been this longstanding feud between them. When did this happen? I don't know. It makes for it makes for you know amazing viewing, and it's so much fun. Continuity out the window, and I just I mean, there's just so many 
scenes from this film that I love. I love the whole last sequence when they're at the castle, right? And the full moon's up, you know, and all, and especially, you know, you got, you got Talbot and Wilbur trying, no, Talbot's trying to take the straps off of Wilbur who's on the table because they were going to take Once his again, brain. Full moon. Full moon. And so you got, you got the, the monster is over on one side. On a, on a table you got Wilbur in one so as Talbot is trying to take the wraps off him he looks up of course the full moon so he turns into the wolfman standing right there right I mean it's just classic and then Dracula comes in and then you have the wolfman and Dracula fighting throughout the house and they occasionally come crashing through a door they're going at it right and I mean here, it's just... here's Dracula throwing like potted plants at him. I love you know, <laughs> what is that going to do right you know, I mean, uh, well, there, no, there. I have to admit, I didn't put this on my list, and of course, this is my favorite. As a matter of fact, it was so funny. Many years ago on AMC, uh, they used to interview actors. You know, this is back when AMC was at truly a classic movie channel in the 1980s and early 90s before they turned mainstream, and they had an interview with Jerry Garcia about movies, and it's out there on YouTube. And his favorite horror film of all time was Avin Kasumi Frankenstein. He said he saw it as a kid in the movie theaters and he goes, it convinced me that there's weird out there. Yeah. And that's what it was. He just it loved that film. Weird. And we all do. Cause it hasn't played. It played on television all the time as a kid, when I was a kid. Always. Um, Channel nine. W O R. It hits. Yep. It hits every, every cylinder uh, to this day. Yet yeah, Lines, you and 20 million other guys. I mean, the fact my favorite to this, to this day, I mean, sitting there in the monster's lap going, Junior, <laughs> Junior, you know, or uh, when when Dracula finally wakes up Frankenstein and he's got Lou Costello is standing there in a catatonic state and as the monster gets out of the crate and he looks at Lou, he gets scared <laughs> and Dracula goes, he won't hurt you, <laughs> you know, I mean, just, you know, as originally the funny thing about it is that I, I think if you uh, have, if you have the Abbott and Costello box sets or on some of the uh, things, the film was supposed to be called Brain of... First off, why this film came about and how it took so long to make it there. So this is going to go back to what I, just, what I discussed before. By 1946, the war was over, pretty much. And Universal Studios was sold. So I believe the reason and rationale, number one, behind going into uh, many of these companies, since it was an international company again, they were getting away of their B film divisions. Uh, Universal, as popular as they were, were always a thorn in the side of Universal. Lou Costello was very demanding and so forth. And their star was starting to plummet a little bit at this point. Uh, the new powers that be, I think, did not want to continue monster films. So near the end, they crammed as many monsters into these House of Frankenstein and House of Draculas. And then actually, you know, the um, um, House of Abbott Castle Frankenstein was really like on the, on the fence. They weren't really sure about doing it, and they didn't want to put a lot of big budget money into it. It ended up being an astronomical hit, and to this day, it's a hit. It's made money for Universal from anything from the first day to the, once again, the Castle film, eight millimeter version, two hours or 12 minutes is great. It's all the highlight reels without having any real dialogue. Um, but it was kind of supposed to be called The Brain of Frankenstein which Lou Costello did not want to make because the script was horrible. And the original script does exist. I, I can't even, I didn't even want to convey what the script was about. It was that bizarre about the miniature, the monsters are miniaturized. And if you happen to eat canned beans around them, if they, they expose the canned beans, they'll grow to normal. Stuff. This is was in the script. So you know why Lou Costello had said, my, my, my daughter can write a better script than this. Uh, but it does revive them, do a lot of improvising. The outtakes, if you've seen on some of the box sets and things, when they were doing it, they had a lot of fun making it. Uh, as always, Lugosi, there was a lot of improvising that made Lugosi very unhappy. But nonetheless, they all seem to have a blast making it. Uh, getting, back to, getting back to Lon Chaney real quick, to make a little analogy about him. One of the reasons Lon Chaney also played these tortured souls so well, it's a known fact that he was a manic depressive. He was, he was manic. And that's why he drank. And he was a heavy drinker. They had to film all of his stuff by a certain time of the day because he was a heavy drinker. Uh, but he did that because he battled depression. It wasn't the fact of living under his father's shadow. He just was depressed. And uh, that's why he drank a lot. And that's, that's why he, was... he did not have a good relationship with his father either. No, he didn't. His father had him off into boarding schools and this and that. And he was, it was you know, as most days when people were in the, in the trade at that point. I mean, my, my father-in-law's family, they were directors. He was a director in Germany, his father. Uh, his mother was an opera singer. 
and he was raised by nannies. He was he never saw his parents. He saw his and in the European way, he saw his parents when it was time to go to bed, kiss mommy, kiss daddy. They had dinner, he ate dinner by himself. So you're very much estranged, but they also have a very big hook on you. Uh, but that's what it was. And I think with Lon Chaney's situation, and plus I think Lon Chaney mother committed suicide. She drank like ant poison or something. Uh, she she ended up killing herself. So it was it was kind of a weird setup and you know. There's not much written about Lon Chaney Sr. as far as his attitude is concerned. There are people that know all about it. I don't know anything much more about it, but no, they had a very strained relationship. And he reluctantly took his father's name because he was going under the name of Creighton Chaney. And it wasn't until he did Of Mice and Men in 1939 in Los Angeles in the film that he actually started being considered a serious actor. He's had some good roles. You know, he did. He was in High Noon. He played the sheriff. But he was well known and Universal really, he played every monster whatsoever which is going to bring me to, no, I'm going to go with this film first, and I'll explain the other one for last, but my next film on the list, okay, is a film called The Mad Ghoul, 1943. Um, in reality, uh, pretty dark and pretty over the top for that time. We're talking about, once again, mad scientist or college professor played by George Zuko, Another one of these guys that always played these demented characters, but also played great in drawing room dramas and British films as well. And The Mad Ghoul is about um, a professor, I believe, a scientist or studies into ancient, ancient alchemy or weird stuff. And he is in love with this young singer. Of course, she's much younger than him. Okay. And she is, once again, another reason why it's on the list, uh, her love or her boyfriend is her piano accompanist played by Torhan Bay. And he in turn gets, well, not that's not her boyfriend. Her boyfriend is actually the guy he turns into the mad ghoul, David Bruce, another contract player. And he basically gets him, you know, he has him inhale something like a tana leaf cocktail or something. And he puts him in a, he puts him in a, in a mesmerized state, which he turns into a zombie or actually a ghoul. His face is all wrinkled. Yep. Uh, the makeup on set was actually green. His hair was red. And they go about, the only way to cure him or to stay alive is he has to cut out the hearts of the recently died, dead and eat the heart. And that's what he has this guy doing. But he wants to have this guy do his bidding to revenge against people. Robert Armstrong is in it. He plays a reporter who's going to unearth it. Um, he actually is, they're going to a, they're going to a mortuary and Robert Armstrong, I think, please puts a fake, you know, it's a small town, small obituary in the thing about this guy being laid out and died. Well, he's actually hiding in the casket. So when George Zuko walks in with his mad ghoul, um, Robert Armstrong opens the top, has a pistol. I got you here. Let's just say it doesn't end well for him. <laughs> um, but it's kind of creepy. It's like the first is, you know, not really a zombie film. It's got in, in the end of the film, not to ruin it. George Zuko becomes a, um, the end of the film is he becomes, uh, his own monster by inhaling this by accident. And you see him near the end, trying to dig up a grave to get to the heart, which is also a very creepy ending. Another one of those standalone yeah. little gems that came at a time by 1943, before they started to jump the shark. And uh, I've always liked that as well. So that's yeah, that's amazing. You surprised me with that pick. That's a good one. I haven't seen that one in a long time either. That's quite good. Yeah, I love I loved, like the kind of like uh, the wrinkle they give the face. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 almost, it's almost like Karloff in The Mummy, the original Mummy. Yes. Well, um, I'm not sure if Jack Pierce did the work on that one. Yeah, I, don't, sure. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But it's a good one. My number one, uh, it's got to be the original Frankenstein. I mean, I love it. It's just so dark and gritty and, um, you know, for the time, pretty disturbing film. A lot of really disturbing scenes in the film. Uh, you know, this is the, the movie that made Karloff a star. Colin Clive, also very notable in this film. I think of both of them, you can't have one without the other in this film. Um, you know, a, a movie that for decades, right, had a couple scenes cut out because you know the hollywood deemed too offensive right the scene throwing the little girl into the water you know watch Maria uh, float like yeah the exactly right i mean that was you know can't show that carrying the dead girl you know can't show that you know they would they would uh cut out colin clive you know the whole scene where he's like it's alive it's alive it's alive you know when he you know 
basically says that I have uh, I have created man. I am as you know powerful as God type of thing. I know it is to feel like to be God or something. Yeah, like that. You, yeah. you can't say that. You couldn't say those things back then. So they cut all that stuff out. So I remember, like as a kid growing up, uh, the version that we always saw on television was that edited version. And then the I remember jump like, cuts. Yeah, I'm trying to remember when they put that back in. Was it the late '80s or the early '90s? They put it on. Actually, they well, they of course they found the footage very much along the line, like with the King Kong footage of him chewing up on a native and stepping yeah. on people. But uh, they found it. They found it, I believe, in the late '70s, early '80s, and it did appear. I remember when it first came out on VHS tape. Yep. Uh, yeah, it. They, they made note that this has, this is a restored version, and of yeah. course they intercept. They put all that stuff in there. Yeah. But that's that's my number one. I mean, it's it's just it's another one of those films that I watch religiously every year. And uh, it's it's as impactful today as the first time I saw it. It's again, it's not a scary film like we think of scary films, but it's a really kind of chilling and disturbing film. I mean, when you think about it, this is 1931 we're talking about here. You put everything in perspective. Yeah. When it was come when it came out. Yeah. As we discussed last Robin time, we waves and creating these, you know, man made, you know, creature and uh you know, and, and let's, we have to give credit to Dwight Fry, who was almost like that kind of like underrated MVP of a lot of these films, because he's in all of them, even he's if he's in the film for like five minutes. Yeah, he's, he plays Renfield, he plays, uh, he's also, like I said, there was a film that came out in 33 called The Vampire Bat. Uh, which was an independent film yes. filmed on all of the universal backlots. You see the Frankenstein village, some of the Burgermeister of the town, the same Burgermeister from Frankenstein. Yep. Dwight yep. Fry plays the crazy guy that likes to pet bats. Yep. Lionel Atwell, whoops, crazy scientist. What else is yep. new? Um, <laughs> but that was done on the, you know, that had a universal feel to it. Although it was not a universal film. Same right. as White right. Zombie, the Halpern brothers, when they did White Zombie, they rented offices in Universal Studios. And that was all filmed in the Bronson Can Can Canyon area, as well as the back lot of Universal. So these films have this much more, hey, these independent producers, they're renting a fraction to rent the sets, as opposed to building these sets. Exactly. Many yeah. sets have been used over and over and over and over. Uh, Frankenstein, I was gonna put on the list, but I figured somewhere along the line, you were gonna have it. You know, I, um, that's why I put the Spanish Dracula, not Dracula. Uh, Frankenstein, very much along the lines. First off, no music whatsoever. Karloff is referred, the monster is referred to as a question mark, not even given credit. Uh, at that time, Karloff was supplementing his income by driving a truck and also appearing in small roles. He was cast in Frankenstein for two reasons. Number one, um, his portrayal, if you notice, there's a film he made in 1931 at Columbia called The Criminal Code, in which he plays a convict who goes in and he murder he actually kills the ward during the prison uprising and he lumbers across the warden's office like frankenstein like this gate this slow gate and then of course the rumor has that james whale saw him at the commissary after doing a day's work as an extra on a western or whatever he was doing he, did, he picked up any work he could and james whale saw him because he was thin and very tall once again he was british too which kind of helped and uh, that's where Whale apparently sealed the deal about it. You know, that's how they got it. Um, first, very much like Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. Put it in perspective in 1931, but even after listening to Edward Van, first you have Edward Van Sloan's introduction. You know, it's like, okay, what are we into right now? What are we in for? You know, and he also apparently did an outro at the end of the film also, but that's been lost. But those opening minutes of the graveside service of the uh, people leaving, the weeping on this course on a set. Finally, there's, um, you know, the guy fills the grave up. I love the scene. I just love the scene where he just lights his pipe, slings the tools of his trade over his shoulder and walks down. Well, in the meanwhile, you've got this scene of, you know, Fritz and Dr. Frankenstein leering over a, a, a wall. <laughs> then going over to dig the grave up, waiting people to go, and then him like kind of caressing the casket, you know, and drinking out, and then, you know, going up, up to the thing, and they find another body hanging, and Fritz climbs up, and they cut the body down. I think they break the neck. I'm not sure they couldn't use it, but you know, they're just like on this, like on this body shopping spree. Yep. But that whole sequence leading up to that is extremely unnerving. I mean, Colin Clive's eyes looking over that thing, and of course, you know, Dwight Fry looking demented anyhow. You know, it's just like, 
and in silence. It's just really one of those great openings that actually far exceeds Dracula in many respects. And not until Frankenstein meets the Wolfman did we ever see another opening that had this oomph to it. Um, but I agree, Frankenstein, you cannot, you cannot mention any universal films without mentioning Dracula and Frankenstein. Yep, yep. But I, I let you have the honor because you're the host. You know, I just want to add some impact. Anyhow, so we're gonna to get to my, not my favorite, but once again, we're back into this standalone one-shot deals. Has nothing to do with the continuity of anything. Now, if you notice along the lines we have, you know, we have Son of Frankenstein, then we have the Wolfman, then we have the Ghost of Frankenstein. They're following each other. Wolfman goes to Frankenstein, meets the Wolfman. Frankenstein meets the Wolfman, goes to the House of um, House of Frankenstein, the House of Dracula, whatever continuity went askew at this point. And then you have these things I mentioned earlier, like you know, the Mad Ghoul or, or Night Monster. All of a sudden, there's this film that pops up, does not fit into the continuity whatsoever. It's a film that has always been debated about the performances in it and so forth. And that's The Son of Dracula with Lon Chaney Jr. as Dracula. Now, why I love this film? Because it breaks the norm of everything. It does not follow the, it does not follow the, the continuity or the stories. It's a standalone. He doesn't have to be Count Dracula. He could have been called the vampire on the bayou, which may have gotten it a little bit more of a reprieve. Uh, but from the opening sequences, you know, it is a film that is downbeat throughout. It is noir. There are really no redeeming characters in it other than our two vampire fighters. Everybody is selfish or, you know, excuse the term, an asshole in it. Um, and of course, you have Lon Chaney Jr. playing Dracula, which many people over the years have said he was miscast. Now, there is a certain, I get that. He's big, he's beefy. I mean, I guess they cast him in it because at that time, you know, they were playing off of that man of a thousand faces, son of the man of a thousand faces. So he'd already played Frankenstein. He played the Wolfman. He played the mummy. Well, let's have him play a vampire. Now, uh, he's not bad in it, but he's not Dracula. He's not the son of Dracula. OK, but what he does, the, the, the thing that saves him in this film is once again, very much along the line when I mentioned the Spanish Dracula, he has a certain animalistic violence in him. He's menacing. He's menacing and he's big and he's, he's imposing yeah, and he's yeah. very deadbeat when very, I mean, deadpan when he talks. So there is certain like frightening aspects. I look, you're sitting there with, you know, you're sitting with Lugosi with his evening clothes on. Okay. Or John Carradine with his top hat. You don't feel threatened. I mean, you feel like saying, what are you going to the opera? What, what's up here? <laughs> you know, John, you know, here's, you know, here's Lon Chaney. Oh, he has a cape. Okay. He's European, you know, uh, but there's something about him. It's like, I don't make any sudden moves. This game, it's going to be a right. He had the mustache, so you know he had, had the mustache too. So, you know, but anyhow, the whole film is great from from the from the way it's done, as in for start. Well, how they discover it's Dracula is like so stupid. That's the only bad point about it. Like Frank Craven, who died a few years later, who plays the town doctor, okay, who has suspicions that this Count Alucard just ain't right, right? Um, he's at the station when all the luggage comes. Could very well have been the casket. And I don't know, he's, he's looking and he's writing down Alucard and he turns the paper over and it says Dracula. So, okay, that's how he discovers Dracula. But he has a certain small town. He should have been in Mayberry RFD as a doctor. <laughs> you know, and he has this simplicity about him. He's on this vampire hunt. This is a film where, you know, they bring one of the local kids in. The kid had been bitten by a vampire. He's got marks on his neck. And what does Frank Craven do? He paints with like Mercurochrome crosses on it. Just weird things like this. Um, Dracula's casket not only is in his, in his basement at this estate, which the family owns, that this daughter of this colonel who's killed in the beginning by Dracula, she's got this mysterious count that she met in the man she met in Europe. Now, meanwhile, she had already been engaged, I believe, to, to Robert Page's character, who's the hero. And she went off to Europe and she met this guy. And she's going to run. She's bringing him back to introduce him to Southern society. And the great thing about it is you could feel that you could feel the way it's filmed going on about this. film. When you feel about this film, you can feel the humidity, the swamp. You can feel it being warm, you know. Um, but he comes back and, and, you know, she, you know, she gets killed by the, by the, by the boyfriend, by accident. Goes to shoot the count. 
And the bullets go right through him and kill his wife, kill his girlfriend. So now they're living in the estate. But not only is the casket down below, I mean, there's chicken feathers in the casket. He's eating live chickens, you know, go into it to sustain himself. He also, there's this one sequence in which um, the Robert, uh, the, the, the fiance, who's now a vampire herself, or she goes up, of course she's a vampire, and his casket rises up from under the water. And all of a sudden this mist comes out of the casket and it turns into him. And then there's this shot of him like basically floating across the water towards her. It's just like, it's just really thought out and well done, you know, different than it was done before. You know, yeah, it's yeah. a downbeat ending. You know, nobody really ends up being happy. Uh, they bring in like the vampire hunters like Frank Craven, another actor by the name of J. Edward Bromberg, who plays like kind of like a Hungarian guy who's a specialist in vampires, who has some of the qualities that Anthony Hopkins displays not the not the eating meat with you know whatever in Dracula, uh, as a Van Helsing. He has these certain qualities that actually Anthony Hopkins has in the later film of Dracula. So they're an interesting vampire fighting duo. And uh, how it ends, and you know, not, not a happy ending. And that's why I think it just stands alone. It's a great film, you know, aside from some of the criticisms of Cheney. Um, and it was like probably one of the last films they did before they jumped the shark. And had they kept on the quality of like the Mad Ghoul and uh, Night Monster and Son of Dracula and not calling it Son of Dracula, in this genre, they could have made films well into the late 40s and worked on different aspects instead of retreading and badly sequelizing a bunch of films. But Son of Dracula, always, always, if you look beside Cheney, it's a great noirish, dark, you know, he runs through the cemetery, he falls down. The only thing that saves him after he kills his girlfriend by accident is he falls down in the shadow of a crucifix in the cemetery and the vampire can't touch him, which was done later on, I believe, in one of the Hammer films. So it's probably a very influential film across the board on how things are handled. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely enjoyable and... I don't think they did themselves any favors by naming it Son of Dracula. I mean, that's, no, right no. There, that's your first thing right there. Um, you know, but of course they're, they're thinking you got to have Dracula in the title because they want to make money, right? Because if it was just kind of like Son of the Vampire, they not do as well. And you know, they, they should have they should have 86 that uh, that mustache too, but um, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, like I said, I think he's a bit miscast, but yeah. I think he's a, he's much more he's much more necessary in this film than say John Carradine would have, who like looked like he weighed about 80 pounds with wet <laughs> wool on, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, but it was it was it was well done, and that that actually stands as one. I, I can watch it over. And I think another reason why I really like it is that I think that was one of the earliest Universals I saw on television oh, for the sheer eeriness of it, uh, and then also Frankenstein. Um, but every so often a film will come out of the 1940s. I don't know if it's because of the, the set design or the filming or the cinematography. Like, for example, there's a film, not to change subject, but there's a film called The Fallen Sparrow with John Garfield in 1943. I think it was 43. And it's about a fellow who was an expatriate, an American patriot fighting in the um, Spanish Civil War. And he was captured and he was tortured by a Nazi interrogator in concentration camp. And they were looking at it because he, owned, he held on to a flag that was held by his unit and the Germans never got it. Well, he comes back to New York, a very damaged human being. And he thinks that his torturer is in the city. He never saw his face, but he knew his footsteps. And he feels his torturer is in New York. Now, the point I'm making about the story, it takes place in Greenwich Village in the winter. And the way the sets are done and this and that, you're watching a black and white movie. There's no fake breath coming out of people's mouth. Uh, you can feel the cold. You can feel that city bone chilling cold because of the sets and how the story's laying out. That's very much along the lines of House of, uh, I'm sorry, the Son of Dracula. You feel that oppressive heat and humidity um, in the Southern mansion down there. So, And there's also a gypsy she has there who gets murdered real quick. It's weird, but my favorite, <laughs> That's one of my favorites, and I can watch it continually over and over and over. There you go. So uh, those are our favorite 10 universal horror films. Some, some people are probably saying, oh, my God, you didn't include the original Mummy in here. Uh, 
I like the original Mummy quite a bit. Uh, I just don't like it as much as I like these other ten. But I, I would I would say the Mummy is probably my eleven or twelve on list. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's hardly any bad horror films. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it, there really isn't. I mean, you could from the. I mean, I like Daughter of Dracula. You know, Dracula's daughter, just mm-hmm. the way it's paced, a little gloomy and sad and yeah. whatever. And what's her name plays a plays a fabulous vampire, female vampire. Werewolf of London. I mean, I like it's got one. It's got it's got Warner Olin playing Doctor Yogami. How bad can it get? You know, and Henry Hull, who does kind of, he, he's not as sympathetic as Lon Chaney, right. but, you know, he's basically like an arrogant prick. But you could feel for him that he went off to do something and, you know, and you know, kind of got bit. And there's always the Marafaza plan, you know, and, but the full fact of playing, you know, this time Warner Olin was also at the top of his game playing Charlie Chan. Yeah. yeah. You know, and he was well known across the board with this. And for him to play all of a sudden like the Tibetan werewolf, who was actually seen in makeup for a very scant moment or two on the mountains, which they should have done with Lugosi in in Wolfman. But I guess it was cheaper. Matter of fact, that dog that played the wolf was in Lon, that film. German Shepherd, yeah. Yeah, he was adopted by Lon Chaney. Yep. Yep. And he appears in another film with him at some point, but he was actually a German Shepherd, a trained German Shepherd. And yeah, Lon Chaney adopted him. As his own, they're, they were inseparable, from what I understand. Yeah, yeah, probably his drinking buddy. I don't know. You know, it's never. It's, you, know, <laughs> you know, they go over to Bella's house for some drinks. I don't know. It's uh, you know, lament their careers. You know, but there are plenty of other great horror films out there. Oh yeah, Paramount. I mean, you know, Murders in the Zoo. I mean, uh, Supernatural. I mean, a lot of other studios made some interesting films, and um, they don't get the rep that Universal does, and maybe deservedly so. But there are some really great. Maybe we should do a show sometime with horror films of the 30s and 40s, other than Universal. Other than Universal, yeah. Oh, we didn't mention uh, Murders in the Room Morgue either, which is uh, that. That's never I like. Really I have well to. Like it. It's yeah, no, some people don't like that movie. I, I do. That's you know, I like it mainly for Lugosi's performance, which I think is great. Um, oh, Doctor Miracle. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Doctor Miracle. So there's yeah, a lot no, of other films we didn't mention here. Uh, you know, Man Made Monster with Cheney, which was the one that really got him noticed to to get the the Wolfman role. But um, I mean, he did like five or six of the Inner Sanctum mystery movies. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, Doctor yeah. Death, uh, Pillow of Death, whatever it was. I mean, they weren't great, but you know, had those Horror Island, which is a fun little comedy thing. One of my genres that I like. I've changed the subject really quick, but we say Evan Carlos and me Frankenstein. I've been a huge fan over my life. Um, of horror dark house comedies love them as a matter of fact another one of those earlier films that we're going to talk about Karloff Lugosi and Laurie a favorite film of mine which I have a one sheet from it I have title cards I saw it as a kid Uh, it's called You'll Find Out with the Kate Kaiser Orchestra have you ever seen that have you you got to see it it's just so um, and there's some creepy moments in that but it's a horror comedy in which you would put people either comedians or in this case, Kate Kaiser and his orchestra at a big mansion to do a thing. And next thing you know, there's something afoot, you know, uh, Cat in the Canary with Bob Hope, Ghostbreakers with Bob Hope. You know, some of these are great. And that's a genre that I'm really, really fond of Um, because it's horror and comedy. That's why Gene Wilder made Haunted Honeymoon some years ago because he was a big fan of these. Uh, But those are something, and these were the things that actually led the way to make Abbott and Costello make Frankenstein because they always knew that these films were big box office. And yeah, on top yeah. of that, Lou and Bud being the popular stars they were and Universal, I mean, perfect timing when they did that film. And I'm so glad they went away from the brain of Frankenstein script. But, oh, you yeah, know, it was yeah, a good call. It's, yeah. yeah, it's a weird one. You're gonna, if you read about it, you're going to sit there and go, what? <laughs> what were they thinking? <laughs> you know, which goes along with the continuity theme. So who cares? Um, exactly. Not caring, just pump out the product. So, but it was a lot of fun today. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming on. So uh, everybody watching, uh, list your favorite Universal Horror films in the comments below. We'll be uh, curious to see what everybody comes up with. I want to thank Dan Brown from The Warehouse in Newburgh, New York, for joining me today on this edition of The Monsters Den. But stay tuned. We got a couple more episodes of The Monsters Den coming up uh, later today. So stay tuned for that. Chris Allo and Rich Catino coming on board. Uh, We are going to talk about uh, some teenage horror films. Uh, as well as I'll be doing one later tonight about the, the giant insect film. So, so Ooh, giant insect films. Giant insect films. You know, like them and all that kind of stuff. So, love uh, them. 
Love that. Stay tuned for that. And uh, lots more coming up this week. Don't forget tomorrow night, the Hudson Valley Square is Monday night, must see TV. Uh, got another cool show lineup for everybody and much more this week. So for Dan Brown, I'm Pardo. Good day and good night, everybody. Thank you.